What's up guys, back with another educational video and this week we are talking about a new study that came out looking at the differences between vegan protein meal versus an omnivore protein meal on animalism. But first, make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment for the algorithm. This one's definitely gonna drum up some controversy because anytime we talk about meat or anytime we talk about plant-based or well, anytime we talk about anything in nutrition, everybody gets all huffy puffy. So this study was out of Van Loon's lab, which if you don't know about the area of protein metabolism, Van Loon, I would consider one of the top five experts in the world currently doing protein metabolism research and probably top three, to be honest. This was somebody who I was reading their research papers when I was in graduate school 15 years ago. Very, very reputable lab, very, very high quality research. This study was done in elderly people, I believe over the age of 65, and they had eight men and eight women, and it was a crossover design, meaning each person got each of the different treatments and there was a washout period between, I think about two weeks. The nice thing about a crossover design is that each person functions as their own control. So you're not worried really about differences in genetics and whatnot because you're assessing the difference between each individual and then looking at the overall effect. What made this study a little bit different than some of the other studies that have been done before? Well, the first thing is it was in elderly people. The second thing is they really were very careful to match the meals to be very, very similar nutrition wise, whereas one meal being uh, omnivorous and the other meal being completely plant-based. Now, why is that important? A lot of research studies out there will match like protein, but then they don't match calories, or they'll match protein and calories, but carbs and fats aren't matched. And this study, I mean, there were some small differences between the two different meals, but they were very, very close. The other thing is, this was using intact whole food sources of protein. Now, this is very important. A lot of the studies out there comparing plant-based proteins versus animal-based proteins in terms of muscle protein synthesis are done on isolated sources of protein. So for example, like whey versus soy, beef protein isolate versus pea protein isolate or something like that, isolated sources of protein. This was done in intact sources of protein. So let's talk about the composition of the two meals real quick before we get into the results. The protein in the omnivorous meal was mostly meat. It was 100 grams of lean ground beef. There was also 200 grams of potatoes, uh, 150 grams of string beans, 200 grams of applesauce, 24 grams of herb butter. The total meal mass was about 700 grams just under. The protein content was 37 grams on average. Now, the people were different body weights and they made it 0.45 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. But on average, if you look at the average across the participants, it's about 36, 37 grams of protein. But obviously people with less body mass took in less, people with more took in more, and they scaled it based on their body mass. Carbohydrate content was 61 grams in the omnivorous meal and fat content was 19 grams and fiber content was 18 grams total calories was right around 600. In the plant group, you have just soybeans, chickpeas, broad beans, each of those was 95 grams. Then you had 200 grams of quinoa and 15 grams of soy sauce. But the macros were very similar. So you had, again, about 36, 37 grams of protein, 68 grams of carbohydrate, 16 grams of fat. So similar carb and fat, not exactly the same, but pretty darn close. Fiber content was a little bit higher at 23 grams of fiber and calories again were around 600, so very similar. So when it came to matching up the meals so that the macros were very similar, they did a really great job. I also wanna point out that this study was highly controlled and people will say, well, there's only eight people in each group. Well, first off, it's not a normal eight and eight because each person is getting the same meal twice. So they're actually getting 16 data points versus if they just did it 16 people comparing at one time, one, it wouldn't be as controlled, and two, they each participant only gets the meal once, whereas here, 16 participants, eight men, eight women, but each person is getting it twice. So I apologize, it's actually 32 data points. Now, the other thing to keep in mind when people will hear something like this, like, why didn't, why didn't they have 1,000 participants? Why didn't they have 100 participants? From the time they came into the laboratory, to begin the continuous infusion of the stable isotope, which is what you use to measure muscle protein synthesis. 
To the time they would have finished, it was 11 hours, most of which involved them laying in a supine position on their backs doing nothing. It is very boring and very long. And they also took four biopsies from them, meaning they're taking a biopsy needle and taking chunks of their flesh out of their leg four different times. So my guess is these folks probably had to be paid for their time because they did that twice, meaning they gave up about a full day of their time, almost 24 hours, and they took eight chunks of flesh out of their legs. And these are elderly people who probably don't like the idea of having chunks of flesh taken out of their legs. Not that any of us do. So again, you don't need that many participants when you have such a high degree of control and such a high quality study. I also looked through their power calculation, which is basically a calculation to know how many subjects you need per group to detect differences. Uh, and their power calculation was spot on. Now, what did they find? Well, when it came to muscle protein synthesis, there were no differences at baseline between the groups, which you'd expect because they haven't had their meal yet. Early on, there's no significant difference, but it does look like the omnivorous group is having a bigger response. And by a couple hours in, there is a significant response that maintains itself where the omnivorous group has a higher rate of muscle protein synthesis. Now, what they did was they did a total area under the curve over the six hours post meal. And what they found was about a 47% greater total rate of muscle protein synthesis in the omnivorous group compared to the plant-based group. And that corresponded with a much greater increase in essential amino acids in the blood, as well as the essential amino acid leucine. And we know leucine is the amino acid that is mostly responsible for triggering muscle protein synthesis. In fact, if you look at the plant-based group, their levels of amino acids, of essential amino acids and leucine, didn't really go up that much. Why is this important? Well, if you look at isolated sources of plant protein, you do see a pretty robust response, especially when you get up to 30 or 40 grams of total protein in isolated sources of plant protein. Why is this important? Well, when it comes to plant protein, the plant protein is bound up in fibrous material of the plant, making it less bioavailable which probably explains why there was a significantly lower response of essential amino acids. The other thing that's obvious is that plant protein just has less essential amino acids than uh, meat protein does. So those two factors probably combine to explain why there was a much lower response of essential amino acids and leucine in the plant group versus the omnivorous group. When it comes to muscle protein synthesis, it makes sense because we do see muscle protein synthesis tend to track with leucine content and essential amino acid content. The other thing to consider is when you look at previous research, 30 grams or 35 or 40 grams of plant protein versus animal protein in previous studies has not really shown significant differences. So why is this study different? The first thing to keep in mind is again, these are intact plant proteins, making them less bioavailable. And also if you look at the essential amino acid response, it is much more sluggish when you, compared to isolated sources of plant protein. I believe the essential amino acid response peaked around 180 minutes or somewhere around there. In isolated sources of protein like whey isolate or soy isolate or pea isolate or, or whatever, you'll see essential amino acids peak around 30 to 90 minutes. So by being in a complete meal, and we saw this in the omnivorous group as well, by being in a complete meal, the amino acid response is much more sluggish. But it was significantly greater in the omnivorous meal compared to the plant meal. So when we put all this data together, we start to see why we might see a more robust response in the omnivorous group. One more thing to keep in mind, the subjects used, elderly. We do know elderly people have what's called anabolic resistance. They have a much lower response of muscle protein synthesis. Now, you can get the same response in elderly as you get in young, but it requires more total protein. When you consider, again, less bioavailability, lower essential amino acid content, for these elderly folks, this particular plant meal probably did not meet the threshold of protein required to maximize muscle protein synthesis. In fact, you didn't really see muscle protein synthesis go up that much really at all from the plant meal which is very strange because when we think about 35 grams of protein, I'm aware of no other study where 35 grams of protein did not 
cause a significant response to muscle protein synthesis, but they've never tested it this way. Again, usually it's been isolated sources of plant protein. How do we reconcile this with the rest of the literature? Because they have done some randomized control trials, human randomized control trials, where they compare plant protein versus animal protein over, you know, say eight, 12 weeks. And most of those studies, when they equate total protein, don't see differences in muscle mass. So how do we reconcile this? I mean, a 47% greater increase in muscle protein metabolism, because if we're looking at the, the kind of the, the mechanism, which muscle protein synthesis is pretty closely tied to gains in lean mass longitudinally, it doesn't seem to make sense. Well, I think the first thing to point out again is these were elderly subjects. This subject group really hasn't been tested in those randomized control trials. Secondly, when you're looking at muscle protein synthesis, one of the difficult things with it is you're looking for small differences between small numbers. These aren't massive differences that you see. Yeah, a 47% difference in muscle protein synthesis sounds huge, but when you consider we're talking about the difference between 0.0042% per hour versus 0.0027% per hour. These are small differences between small numbers. And so if you have eight or 12 or even 16 weeks, even in studies, if we look at studies where we're looking at high protein versus low protein equating calories, sometimes we don't even see differences in those studies over that period of time. Gains in lean mass and gains in skeletal muscle take a long time. Now, I'm not saying we should just trash all those human randomized control trials, because obviously, if anybody beats the drum of human randomized control trials, it's this guy. But I'm just looking for possible explanations of how to reconcile this data. Now, based on this muscle protein synthesis data, do I think if they continued this out for a long period of time, that they would see differences in muscle mass, I, I do think they would see differences in muscle mass. So what does this mean? Does this mean that if you're an elderly person, plant protein is garbage and you shouldn't use it? I don't think that's the take home here. I think the take home is if you are elderly, because in young people, this doesn't seem to show up at least, not when we look at isolated sources of protein, Maybe it would if we looked at these intact sources. But if you're elderly or you're young and you're just worried about you know, being optimal and you wanna be plant-based for um, ethical reasons, for whatever it is, what I would recommend is you're probably gonna to wanna to use some kind of isolated source of plant protein. So something like a soy protein isolate or combining pea and soy or combining uh, pea and corn or some of these other proteins to get a full spectrum of amino acids because we do know these isolated sources of plant proteins will cause a much more robust increase in muscle protein synthesis compared to intact plant proteins, at least based on some of this data. So that would be the first thing I recommend. And this may be a situation where an essential amino acid supplement for people who are vegan or plant-based may actually make some sense because you can add it to your plant proteins and make them higher quality because you're fortifying with essential amino acids. Obviously, I'm not saying that you can't build muscle on a plant-based diet. Plenty of people do it. Plenty of people function very well on plant-based diets. What I'm saying is you gotta be a little bit more careful, a little bit more diligent, especially if optimizing lean mass is one of your goals. Really cool study. It fits with some of the data I did in my PhD thesis. Uh, and it fits with some of the other data we have. Not directly because I'm aware of no other study that actually did this exact thing, but the pieces fit from some of the other molecular signaling data we have. One of the reasons we developed our app Carbon Diet Coach is because we don't push any one methodology of dieting. We want to give you the options to do whatever you prefer, whether that's plant-based, low-carb, keto, balanced, low-fat, we have all those options for you so you can choose the diet that fits your dietary preference and we will make sure that you get the macros and calories to optimize your response based on your goals and your individual metabolism and our app adjust those as you go to make sure that you don't plateau, that you keep progressing towards your goal. Make sure you click the link in the description, download and subscribe today. I'll catch you guys next time.